All right, and I just have everyone set up on mute uh, at the moment, and I'll open it up for questions as we get to the end. And this will be a short sort of overview because we'd rather have you get out and spend a beautiful day out in the Institute Woods than looking at PowerPoint slides. So once again, my name is Rick Curtis. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm Princeton class of 79. I'm the director of Outdoor Action. And today we're going to take a look at the Institute for Advanced Study. So uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. And I know people will continue to sort of roll in as we go. So the first thing to do is to sort of talk about the fact that although we're in Princeton, there is actually an incredible amount of nature, wildlife, and hiking trails just close by. In fact, even within walking distance from campus. And absolutely my favorite place to go is the Institute Woods. The Institute Woods is part of the Institute for Advanced Studies. And so I think we wanna say a little bit about the Institute for Advanced Studies. And this is just looking at the overview map of the trail. Um, the Institute was founded in 1930 and it's not connected with Princeton University. It's really sort of a privately funded um, institute focusing on things like mathematics, the humanities, economics. Um, Albert Einstein was uh, at the Institute for Advanced Studies. And so that was why uh, Einstein was in Princeton. He was never actually uh, at Princeton University as a faculty member. He was uh, a fellow at the Institute. And um, part of the Institute, they set aside uh, a large amount of land um, adjacent to the Institute. Um, in a program in New Jersey that's known as Green Acres. And so one of the great things about the Green Acres program from a, a land and nature preservation uh, approach is that um, it allows people to sort of place land um, in this Green Acres status where it's open to the public. And part of the benefit of that is that whoever the actual landowner is doesn't pay the normal amount of taxes on it. And so that, that's an incentive. Um, and over time, the, in the, uh, the ongoing incentive is if you ever decided to like sell the land to turn it into a mall, you'd have to pay all the back taxes um, that, that you never would have paid um, had, you, um, you know, had you not gotten that tax break. So the longer something like this exists in Green Acres, the bigger the incentive it, it is to keep it. And that's, that's one of the, the reasons for having the Green Acres program and lots of land within New Jersey is preserved under Green Acres. When we think about the Institute and where it's located, we also sort of wanna think about the history. And so we're, we're talking about when the Institute was founded, but I also wanna do a land acknowledgement because this land is all part of the traditional lands of the Lenni Lenape people. And if you look at this map, you can see really that all of New Jersey and then stretching over into Pennsylvania, down into Delaware and up into Southern New York um, is, is the traditional lands of the Lenny Lenape. And I wanna read the, the land acknowledgement that the Lenny Lenape people asked to be part of recognizing their historical rights to this land. The land upon which we gather is part of the traditional territory of the Lenni and Lenape called Lenapehoki. The Lenape people lived in harmony with one another upon this territory for thousands of years. During the colonial era and the early federal period, many were removed west and north, but some also remain along the continuing historical tribal communities of the region. The Nanticoke Lenni and Lenape tribal nation, the Ramapo, Lenape Nation and the Powhatan Renape Nation, the Nanticoke of Millsboro, Delaware, and the Lenape of Cheswell, Delaware. We acknowledge the Lenape as the original people of this land and their continuing relationship with the territory. In our acknowledgement of the continued presence of the Lenape people in their homeland, we affirm the aspiration of the great Lenape chief Tamanend that there be harmony between the indigenous people of this land and the descendants of the immigrants to this land. As long as the rivers and creeks flow and the sun 
moon, and stars shine. Let's take a look at how to get to the Institute Woods. So it's uh, oh, a, an easy walk from campus. Um, here you kind of see a map that's showing the, the main campus. And if you were to, to walk from the university store and go down College Road as if you're heading towards the graduate college, um, and you're basically walking um, all the way over to what is called Springdale Road. Springdale is the road that runs on the far side of the golf course, parallel to Alexander Road, which runs down to Forbes College. And from anywhere along Springdale Road, there are a whole series of roads that go across, that cut across um, to Olden Lane. And you basically walk down to the very end of Olden Lane. And that is kind of the closest access point to the Institute Woods. So it's about, you know, according to Google Maps, it's about a 27 minute walk to get from the U store uh, down to that opening part of the Institute Woods. Um, and it's uh, uh, 1.4 miles. So let's sort of take a look at the, at the Institute itself. So this is just a shot. And again, you can see that same point along that upper part of the trail. This is looking uh, at a satellite view and the Institute Woods is roughly 500 acres. Um, and, and it's a, a rich ecosystem and wildlife. Um, it's got wonderful trails. It's got great bird life. Um, this winter has been actually really good. I've spent lots of time down there cross country skiing this winter. Um, it's a day use area only. So that's something to keep in mind. There's no camping permitted. Um, and there are other parking areas, but again, for most of the folks who are on this call, who may be just walking from campus, you wouldn't bother to be driving. Um, it is important, and we'll talk a little bit about Leave No Trace, that you respect the, the fact that this land has been there for a long time, um, and that being able to enjoy it really means taking care of it for all of us who go down there. So let's sort of think a little bit more about this. Um, at the very bottom of the Institute is Stony Brook, which is the creek that actually flows into Lake Carnegie. For folks who don't know the history of, of Lake Carnegie, it's actually an artificial lake. Um, it is the basically made by Stony Brook, which flows in below graduate school housing. And then further down from where the lake is, there is another sort of larger uh, river that comes in the Millstone River. And the combination of those two um, is what flows out at the, below the dam um, north on Nassau Street. Um, the end of Lake Carnegie, there's a dam. And so Stony Brook, this is part of the, the upper headwaters of Stony Brook flowing along um, the, the, down, the southern part of the Institute Woods. There's really kind of a rich ecosystem here, which is one of the reasons it's such a great wildlife area, because you have kind of a mix of ecosystems. You can see um, sort of to the west, you have farm fields, you've got forest, uh, you've also got the sort of river corridor. And then you'll notice there's a spot marked on the map, the Charles Rogers Wildlife Refuge, which is actually sort of a marshland. So whenever you have different ecosystems butting up against each other, it's what's known as a transition zone. So when you go from forest to field or field to, to stream, forest to stream or forest to marsh, you get a really rich transition between those ecosystems. And so that's a really rich ecosystem for different types of wildlife. This is just giving you a kind of a comparison of the size of the Institute Woods. So, the rectangle showing the main campus from Nassau Street down to the lake, that's roughly the same size as the Institute Woods. And so again, the Institute, as you can see, is actually extends beyond the boundaries of that rectangle. So this is a, this is a pretty big area. If you think how big campus is to walk around in, um, the Institute is a, is a comparable size. So once we are down, and we've kind of reached the, this is this entry point. 
that I was talking to at the base of Olden Lane. These are the major trails that run through the Institute. And I'll, uh, at the end, I'll put a, a copy of the PDF of this map. This is the map that's published by the Institute for Advanced Study. So the, the Advanced Study campus is right here. And the Institute is really easy to navigate around in. That's one of the, the great things about it. And you can see that there's a whole set of trails throughout this system. If you look down here at the, the bottom of the map, um, you'll see that the sort of orange arrows are basically a thousand feet. So that's kind of giving you a little bit of scale. Each of these orange arrows is about a thousand feet. And then um, each of the sort of uh, brown arrows is like 750 feet. So that gives you kind of a rough zone to think about in terms of what the trails are like. When you're coming down and I will typically start, you know, over here, this is, would be the closest point to campus. You can think about this as just kind of a grid box and there are th three major um, sort of, these are roughly east-west trails, the upper, the middle, and the lower down here that's parallel to Stony Brook. And then here's the actual Delaware and Raritan Canal down here. And then there are a bunch of trails perpendicular to that. In terms of getting around the Institute, you're basically, when you're along this trolley track trail up here, you're at the highest point. And so any of these trails will have a, a discernible downhill character to them as you drop down into the floodplain along Stony Brook. And that makes it really easy to navigate around because if you're ever on one of these trails and you're sort of like, well, geez, I'm not sure if I'm on the middle trail or the founder's trail, you can always tell whether you're going uphill or downhill. And so you know wherever you happen to be, hey, if I want to get back to this kind of gravel trolley track trail up here, what I need to do is just walk uphill. And although it, sometimes you might get a little confused whether you're on this one or that one, as long as you're going uphill, you know you're always going to get back here. And then, and then basically turning right is going to take you back to Olden. So this is really a, a, a good map to help you kind of get around. And um, there's lots of different places to explore here. There is also sort of the cornfields and stuff that are out here. Um, and you know, during certain seasons, um, obviously, this is an active farm, and so those those uh, fields are are particularly the ones out here are being actively used. Um, in the winter time, when it's covered with snow, it's great cross country skiing out in the fields as well. So let's take a look at just a sample route. This is one of the routes that um, I like to hike. Um, and this will just give you a sample for thinking about what you might want to do when you head down there yourself. This is a 2.34 mile, um, and it's kind of doing most of the outer perimeter of, uh, of the trails here. So it's going along the trolley trail out to the far end, down this far trail, and then dropping down all along Stony Brook here. And um, there is, uh, right here, there is a hanging bridge that goes over Stony Brook, a little suspended wire cable bridge, which is really fun to see. And then from there, you can come back up and you can see there are obviously multiple pathways you can go. When you get a, a little ways up here, this is a couple hundred feet up from the, where the swinging bridge is, there's kind of a junction of three trails and off to your right, um, there'll be a little blue belays trail and and um, this trail is tinier than most. Um, most of these trails are quite wide. You, you know, they're sort of more almost like a dirt roadish. They're not dirt, but in terms of the width, they're they're quite wide. Um, and this is actually kind of a narrow trail and it zigzags around. It drops over a, a little creek that's sometimes dry. And I really enjoy this trail because you really kind of feel like you're kind of in the jungle a little bit in here. You're really close to the trees and stuff. And then that pops out here. Um, and if you turn right, 
um, you can head along and there is a nice birding platform um, that looks out over the Wa Rogers Wildlife Refuge, the march here that you can get up to and look over the cattails and some of the marshlands. And that trail continues up, pops over another little tiny wooden bridge that's over a creek. Um, and then there's a stretch of trail that then pops up north. Um, there's actually a, a lot of uh, uh, evergreen trees in here. And then you pop up to here. Um, here you're kind of at the back of the, the Institute, um, you know, some of their construction sheds and equipment. Um, there actually is just kind of a grassy field right here. So you can just walk across this grassy field. There are a couple of private houses here and you end up back at the same spot at Olden. Or you can cut back across um, what's called the pipeline trail here. Um, and so there actually is, there's a, there's a sewer line that runs underneath a section of this trail. And so this trail going across is actually very wide. Um, and then again, in this, in this particular um, route that I took, I just came back up one of these trails um, back up to here. So you can do a variety of different kinds of loops in here, and it's really fun um, to go around and, and explore. And again, this is one of, one of the routes I really enjoy doing. And a great part of the Institute, and why it's particularly fun now that we have some, some good weather now, is because it's so close, it's something you can see and go to pretty much anytime you want. And it's really wonderful to see it in all sorts of different seasons. So right now there really are, there aren't any trees on the leaves yet. And so it's, you know, we're kind of like um, coming out of winter. So to be able to go down there now, and then over the next two months, watch what happens as spring really begins to unfold. Another thing that can be really helpful um, as, as well as taking a map is um, just putting a little GPS app on your phone. And these are a couple ones. One of the ones that I recommend is, is Gaia GPS um, because it's, uh, there's a free version with most of these things, as you can imagine, um, there's always a paid version, but you can go to, to the Gaia GPS and get it on um, iOS or Android. And when you download it from the store, as usual, you'll see a lot of screens saying, oh, here, go ahead and give us your email address and sign in. Usually I know on iOS, up in the top right corner, there's a little like skip this option. And so you don't have to sign up for an account. You can go ahead and download it. And the free version will give you a live map. Um, you know, I've looked at it on my phone. It has the trails on the Institute. And it will show you a nice little arrow icon of where you are. And as you walk around, that little arrow is going to move around with you. So um, if you're ever, you know, you're off someplace like the Institute Woods or wherever, and you're sort of like, yeah, I'm really not sure where I am. Having an app like this is really helpful because, you know, you can always go, hey, here I go. What I need to do is walk down this way, turn right. I'm going to go back up to the trail. So that can also be something that's, that's really useful um, to have with you. Um, a couple other resources, and I'll put these uh, put these in the chat. Um, one is the the PDF, the trail map that we've been looking at, um, that's published by the Institute for Advanced Studies, and then they also have a separate map that kind of shows the different trail markers down there. Um, this photograph is of uh, Professor Henry Horn, um, who was a, a EEB professor at Princeton. He spent lots of his uh, time in the ecology and, and evolutionary biology department studying the Institute Woods. He's written bunches of papers about it. And um, I just sort of put this as a tribute to Henry because he has introduced so many people um, uh, during his career at Princeton to the Institute and, and to um, the, the rich natural history there. And so uh, I know I'm indebted to learning a, a lot about nature from Henry, as are so many other Princetonians. So although he is not with us anymore, uh, it's still really uh, wonderful to be able to sort of salute all that, that he has done. So speaking of that, another one of the things that we want to talk about just whenever you go outdoors is, is thinking about Leave No Trace. So um, the Institute is a wonderful resource it's really important to 
uh, to keep it clean. So when you go down there, if you see trash, please you know um, pick it up and 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 bring it back and dispose of it properly. Um, I think we we hauled out. Um, I think probably forty. Um, trash bags full of stuff from when we did that Institute Woods cleanup many years ago. And if you're not familiar with Leave No Trace principles, Leave No Trace, um, lnt.org um, has all the basic things to think about. But these are the seven principles that, that they always talk about is planning ahead and preparing when you're going on a trip, travel and camping on durable surfaces. So the fact that the trails are there and that they're well used, um, they're, they're fairly hard packed um, is, is an impact to the environment. But by traveling on the trails that are there, we maintain um, that impacted zone and we keep the other areas more pristine. Obviously disposing of waste properly, leave what you find. Um, you know, there's some wonderful things down there, incredible surprises that you'll see. And it's great for somebody else to be able to see those things too. Um, obviously, this is not a camping area, so there shouldn't be campfires there. And also be respectful of wildlife. There's lots of rich wildlife down in the Institute Woods. Um, obviously, there, there are deer, there are raccoon. Um, you may see red fox. Every once in a while, you'll see some trotting along their trails during the day. There are great horned owls. Um, you know, then you can go down to where Stony Brook is. And um, there, are musk, there are muskrats down there. There's some beaver in the area. Um, so there's you know, great blue herons that you'll see sometimes down along Stony Brook, along the water. There are uh, snapping turtles um, in Stony Brook. So there's, there's incredible wildlife down there. And so whenever you get a chance to see wildlife, that's a really special moment. And also be considerate of other visitors. So. Lots of people use these trails, uh, which is wonderful. You'll see people down there with their little kids in strollers, and you'll see, um, you know, people of all ages. Um, the the Princeton um, cross country team often uses that for for training and for races. Um, so it's it's a it's a great community resource. But we also want to maintain it um, for others. Safety, obviously being considerate of other people, it's important to be wearing a mask when you're down there and, and doing social distancing. Um, we talked about you know, having a map um, and knowing where you are. Um, just an, a, a little side note um, is that we talked about how you sort of start up high and you drop down to the floodplain. So after a couple of days of heavy rain, um, the trail section that's right down along Stony Brook does flood. Um, and so, you know, just as you're hiking there, you know, you know if, you, if you go there after a rain, just be aware of that. And so um, you've got to decide whether you want to sort of hike through, you know, an inch or two of water in the mud. Um, and it drops pretty quickly, but the, the sort of mud and muck stays there for a while. So, um, Right now, we're still in pretty cold temperatures, particularly still at night. It's, it's cool. It can be down still around freezing. Um, as we get later into the spring, um, it is always important to be aware of ticks um, because ticks do carry disease like Lyme disease. And so whenever you're um, you know, kind of out hiking around, um, you do you know, want to come back and, and always do a tick check. Um, and again, at this time of year, both because ticks haven't sort of really started to come out, you know, until we start to get a little bit warmer, um, but also uh, lots of the vegetation has died down. So you're not walking through tall grass and things like that um, right now. But, you know, you know, by, by uh, late spring, midsummer, you know, there are definitely some grassy areas that grow up. This is obviously none of this gets mowed or anything. So always sort of be aware of, of ticks. And here are just a, a, some shots of the Institute. Here's the, the swinging bridge um, that I mentioned. Um, and you can see this is one of the typical sort of trails. You can see this is pretty wide. This is that middle trail kind of going across. Um, and um, here's some other, you know, the colors in the fall down there can be incredible. 
Um, so we've got on the left side, we've got fall. Um, you know, on, on the right side, you can see um, the trees aren't sort of fully, um, it, you know, leafed out yet. So this is kind of late spring, but you've got some, some little wildflowers things coming up here. So it's just got an incredible, um, in, incredible environmental beauty to go down and, and enjoy. And it's also wonderful to be able to go down there and find a little spot just to sit. I will often go down there um, and, um, you know, find a place that's comfortable and sit on a log and, and just enjoy being out in nature. And I've spent thousands of hours down in the Institute Woods, um, you know, both just enjoying the nature um, and doing animal tracking, um, looking for wildlife. It's just a wonderful, wonderful spot. Um, here are just a couple of other uh, resources for finding local trails. So if there are folks who are, who are here who don't happen to be um, in the Princeton area right now, if students, if you're um, still uh, you know, living at home or, or, or in other areas, these are some great resources. So the Hiking Project um, basically has lists of trails all over the country. So does alltrails.com. Hiking Project is free. All trails is one of these things where it is can be a paid service. You can go in and search for things, and and so that can be free. And if you want to actually be able to, you know, download maps and print maps and stuff like that, you have to pay. But you can find these places through some of these websites. And the National Park Service has a brand new app that they just came out with, which is really tremendous. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know, like, it seems like the trails are pretty chill in terms of like they're wide and like. Elevations like fine. Do you think like sneakers would be okay for most of the trails? Or would yeah, you sneakers are fine. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. This is not. You don't need hiking boots for this. Um, cool. You know, as you can see from from you know, um, you know, as you can see that the the trails are just really easy. Um, so uh, you know, I would say it's also a great place to run. Um, you know, if you're used to, if you're used, if if you're not used to trail running, this isn't difficult trail running. But there are, you know, there are roots and rocks and stuff like that in places. So, you know, it is one of those situations where for runners, you do need to be sort of paying attention to where you're putting your feet, um, you know, because it's, it's not like running on a road surface or on a track. Thanks for joining us for today. Um, if you are looking for other information about local places to go, you can go to the Outdoor Action website at outdooraction.princeton.edu. Thanks and have a great day.